excludes the people who have no idea where he's getting into. So, anyways, give him a warm welcome for being willing to do that. Well, thank you very much for that kind invitation and kind introduction. And what a beautiful crowd we've got here today. I want to thank everybody for taking time out from your busy days to hear a little bit about this message. And I want to begin with uh, actually something I hadn't intended to include in the talk, but it's a story. And with that introduction, I have to tell a story. And, and this story gets to a little bit about how I became interested in stem cells and embryos. And it goes back to the early 90s when I was working in the biotech industry. And I was working at a company that was involved with and doing prenatal diagnost diagnostics. And some may think, well, that's a bad thing. Well, no, it's not. The diagnosis is a good thing. It's what people do with the information that can be a bad thing. But one of our colleagues at a hospital there in the Boston area, she and her other professional colleagues had discovered that the placenta was leaky and that some of the cells from the fetus in the developing embryo crossed the placenta and made their way into the mom's blood circulation. And I'm with a company that's doing prenatal diagnostics. Well, those diagnostics are done from an amniocentesis where you actually have to stick a big needle in and penetrate the amniotic cavity to get some of that amniotic fluid. That's an incredibly invasive test to the fetus. And we thought, my word, if we can get cells from mom's blood that are fetal cells, then we can do a non-invasive test and get a prenatal diagnostic, and we've eliminated the risk of miscarriage that's associated with sticking that big needle in there. And it's a significant risk, and it prevents a lot of women and mothers from having the test done when it can be very useful and advantageous to get that information. So <clears throat> we set about uh, studying this, and one of the women that enrolled in the study was young, early 20s. She told us it was her first pregnancy. She was healthy. She met all the requirements for the study. So we took some of her blood. And we looked at it with the appropriate antibodies. And we found male cells in her blood. Now, this was a woman. And women don't have Y chromosomes. And these were distinctly male cells. So we thought, wow, this, it works. We can do it. We found male cells. This woman's going to give birth to a, a baby boy in a few months. Well, she gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. And we thought, well, we had a problem here. It actually you know, it raised a couple of issues. If we're going to do a diagnostic test, we'd better be able to distinguish between the current pregnancy and anything that happened earlier. And clearly, those male cells we found weren't hers, and we didn't know where they came from. She told us this was her first pregnancy. Well, we were scrambling. We went back, and we checked everything. We thought maybe we had made a transcriptional error when we were recording information or labeled a slide wrong. We rechecked all the microscope slides, and no, they were male cells, no doubt about it. So we went back and talked to the woman, and we said, would you please review your reproductive history that you gave us? And, and she looked it over, and, and she looked at that one line. She goes, oh, she says, I had a miscarriage two years ago. And we thought, aha, that may be where the cells came from. So, but that presented the problem. We had to distinguish if we're going to do a test, those cells from the current pregnancy. That turned out to be easy. We could do that. But it raised the other question, how long do these cells hang around in the maternal blood circulation. And we kept using the word persist. And we went to the scientific meetings and we presented the research and said that the cells persisted. And after one of the meetings, I went and visited a colleague at MD Anderson, 
in Houston, and I showed him the abstract from the paper we had presented. And, and he looked at it, and he sees that word persist, and he focused on it, and he goes, and he's a big German guy, and he just sort of leans back, and he laughs, and he goes, no, no, no. He says, cells don't live that long. He says, they don't persist. He says, what's happening is those cells that enter the maternal circulation are establishing a clone in some maternal tissue. And over the years, they just toss out cells into the circulation, and those are the cells that you're finding. And we thought, well, that's something that we can easily test. So we went back and we started another study with more women. But this time, we didn't enroll women that were pregnant. We enrolled women that hadn't had a son in a long, long period of time. And in this particular study, the oldest woman hadn't had a son in 27 years. And we looked at her blood, and we found she had six sons, this particular lady. We found male cells, lots of male cells, in her blood. So now we know that these cells are hanging around for at least 27 years. The people that initiated in the original discovery of the leaky placenta went back and started doing some more work. And this time they started enrolling women and they contacted their surgeon colleagues at the hospitals to get biopsies from septuagenarians and octogenarians that were coming in for abdominal or thoracic surgery. And they would get tissue biopsies from a variety of tissues when they came in, and they would look for male cells in those tissues. Obviously, these were women that had had sons. And they found male cells in every tissue they looked in. So, and it turns out that these cells are a type of stem cell. Now, stem cells, as we know, are very useful in regenerative medicine. Our body uses them to repair damaged tissue all the time, and we don't even have to get involved with that. Our body does that naturally. So I, when I read about some of this, I, this is after I had moved to Wisconsin, and I'd read about this, and I thought, wow, I, I better call these researchers and find out what's going on here. So I called Diana Bianchi, the original researcher that we had worked with in the early 90s, and I, I asked her to sort of bring me up to date. And she's explaining some, some of the things that they were doing to me. And I said, might this explain the longevity difference between males and females? Because, hey, their cells are involved in regenerative medicine. And, and she stopped me and she goes, no, Tim. She goes, it's not the difference between males and females. She goes, it's between mothers and others. So mothers have those cells floating around in their bodies. And all you mothers that are here today, just uh, know that you carry those little gems of your children with you, all your children, not just your sons, for the rest of your lives. So yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yahoo. So. I got to tell that story because that's how I first became interested in stem cells. So now let's look at the, uh, the grandeur of the human embryo. And the little quote that was up there by Jerome Lejeune, who's the father of medical genetics, is very apropos for this talk. He says, health by death is a desperate mockery of medicine. And that doesn't need to be explained to anybody. But let's just look at human development. First stage of human development is a one-celled embryo. It's called a zygote. Science has a particular lexicon. It has its own vocabulary, and everybody that uses those words knows what they mean, and they have a specific meaning. And that's why scientists can communicate among themselves. We're going to get into that. Second stage is a morula. It's a group of cells. Incidentally, this comes from a, a Greek word that means yoked, Y-O-K-E-D, 
like in an oxen yoke, holds a couple of oxen together. They're joined because the egg and the sperm have joined. They're yoked. Morula is from a Latin word that means mulberry because it looks like one. This is a blastocyst, and this little cluster of cells right down here is called the inner cell mass. These are the cells that scientists want to do embryonic stem cell research with. That's the special cell. Now, after embryonic development, we have fetal development begins, and then a baby's born, a neonate, a newborn, and I just want to point out, uh, I chose this slide about two weeks ago, long before Sunday's game. So, <laughs> and I was previewing the slides and I thought, wow, how appropriate. <laughs> but uh, then we develop into a child and, and then an adult. Important thing to keep in mind about human development, it's not about time. It's about organ development, tissue development, and size. It's not about time. We're fully developed, 100% developed by the time we're about uh, 21, 22, early 20s. You could live to be 100, but that doesn't mean that when you're 20, you're only 20% developed. We're 100% developed. So we'll get in and look at a little closer at this timeline of human development. Well, let's take a look at what the, scienti or what the scientists were telling us shortly after stem cells were first isolated from a human embryo. And the best scientists in the country, National Institutes of Health, published a large document on stem cells, embryonic and adult. And they said, at this stage, any therapies based on the use of embryonic stem cells are hypothetical and highly experimental. And they were. And not just experimental, highly experimental. And they went on and later in the document, they say whether these embryonic cells will provide any advantages over stem cells derived from cord blood or adult bone marrow remains to be determined. And this is important because in the 1950s, researchers began working with bone marrow stem cells and treating cancer and anemia patients with bone marrow stem cells in the 1950s. So it had been going on for almost half a century. Cord blood stem cell work had been going on since the 1970s. And the scientists knew that. And these scientists, this is a scientific document, they had to stick to the vocabulary of scientists and, and tell the facts of the science, which they did. But we, the people, the public, don't read NIH scientific documents. We watch TV for the news, and we read the newspaper. So what did we hear in 2001? We didn't hear what the NIH scientists were told, telling us. This is what Ted Koppel told us on Nightline. Although adult stem cells have some uses, some uses, they'd already been used to treat over 40 disorders, cancers and anemias. Embryonic stem cells are the most successful to date. That's an unabridged sentence from Ted Koppel's newscast on Nightline. He flat out tells us that embryonic stem cells are the most successful to date right after the NIH scientists had told us that it's hypothetical and it's experimental and if they're, if they're going to be better than the cord blood and bone marrow, uh, we don't know. It remains to be determined. But this is what we're told. So this is what everybody thinks about embryo stem cells. And if you read the newspapers, New York Times, they were talking about alternatives to embryos. And that sounds like a good thing to do. There's some cells that are naturally present in adults. Yes, there are. 
Researchers have found such cells in a variety of tissues and say they seem. Say they seem? No, they've been using them for 40 plus years to treat disorders. So it's not a say they seem. And the reason they've been using them is because they already knew that they were part of the body's normal repair mechanism. There are no ethical issues in studying those cells, but the problem is putting them to work to treat diseases. So far, no one has succeeded. There's a record of 30 plus years of success, and she's telling us that no one has succeeded. And I had mentioned in the early 2000s some of these success stories with cord blood and bone marrow. And the person I was talking to was saying, well, yeah, but those are all cancers. Those are all cancers. And I, I said, I said, so? I said, is cancer not a disease that medicine should be concerned about? You know, tell that to the cancer patient. Those are all cancers. So it, it's important to understand the difference between a cell and a life. This is real important. Because I mentioned how important it is for scientists to use the vocabulary and the lexicon of their field to communicate. The sad thing is that's not always used to communicate to the public. And journalists certainly don't use that lexicon and vocabulary to communicate with the public. This thing on the left here is a human egg. It is a cell. It has a nucleus which has only one set of chromosomes, the maternal set, but that's a cell. There are some ethical issues in working with this particular cell because you obviously have to harvest the cell from a woman of reproductive age. But, but they certainly aren't the bigger ethical issues that surround things like taking a human life. Oops. On the right, is a zygote. This is the first stage of human development. It's one cell in size, but it has two sets of chromosomes, one from the mother and one from the father. So it's a diploid cell, day one of development, and the thing that separates this from just a cell is that this cell is a human life and is capable of self-directed development. It can do it by itself and it doesn't need any help from anybody. So let's look at this early embryo. A zygote, morula, blastocyst, these are all human lives. And one of the things we look at here Next is as we get into this cloning issue, scientists that wanted to work with stem cells from embryos or wanted to do cloning had to some way make it sound or look like these were not human and that they were not lives or that they were not embryos. Because if they can convince people of that, then they're golden and they can go and do the research they want. First, let's take a look at the, how fast and rapid embryonic development is. And this is the first uh, major take-home message here with human embryology and human development. The zygote is day one of human development. It's one cell. The fetus is at eight weeks of human development. Fetal development begins at eight weeks. Embryological development ends at that point. And here we've got a prominent head, all the facial features, tissues and organs are present. Many of them are functional at this point. And that's at about 56, 57 days. To put that in perspective of how rapid this occurred, one cell to everything, Thanksgiving to today is the time period that's elapsed for this much development, eight weeks. And to even put it in better perspective, the period at which scientists harvest stem cells from an embryo 
is the blastocyst stage. That's at about one week of development. So from the blastocyst, when they harvest the stem cells and kill the embryo to fetus, that's seven weeks. That's about the length of Lent, if you include the Sundays. So it's an incredibly short period of time. And not only is a, a good chunk of human development completed, but nearly all of you, two-thirds of human development is complete at this stage. Let's just take a look at that. Remember, I said development's not about time. It's not about months. It's not about years. It's about development of tissues, development of organs, and how big we are. So one accurate, very good way to look at human development is how many times that original cell, the zygote, has doubled. And when scientists are working with cells in a petri dish in the lab, they talk about cell doublings all the time. So it's, this isn't something that's foreign to scientists to talk about cell doublings. But by the time the blastocyst implants in the uterus, over 15% of development has occurred. That's about 250 plus cells the size of that embryo. By fetal development, two-thirds almost of human development is complete. By the time we're born, over 90% of human development is complete. All we got to do is get a little bigger. Early childhood, 98%, and of course, adulthood, 100%. And I put 80 cell doublings in here just to put things in perspective, because scientists have said that the reason adult stem cells aren't good and that you can't use them is because they'll only double in the lab maybe 80 times, where embryonic stem cells will double uh, infinitely. They haven't found the end yet for doublings on embryonic stem cells. But with adult stem cells, maybe 80 cell doublings in the lab, and they've said that it's not enough cells. You can't get enough cells that way, 80 cells. Well, I did the math. And just to put this in perspective, 80 cell doublings is more cells than there are in 35 billion knees. That's more than five times the world population of cells. So, and they're telling us it's not enough cells. So, which clearly it is enough cells. So let's just take a look to recap here. Zygote, morula, blastocyst, over 15% development complete. Fetus, two-thirds of human development is complete. A newborn, over 90% human development is complete by this stage. And I might add the last 10% of human development is extremely critical from newborn to adulthood because this is the time when many of those newborns in that last 10% of development can become things like Vikings, Bears, or Lions fans, okay? So that's real critical stage of development there. But extremely rapid development during embryological development, and that's important to keep in mind. And also, it is self-directed. Scientists can't control human development. So let's just back up a little bit and look at how embryos are made normally, and then we'll look a little bit at cloning, and then we'll look at what the scientists are saying about it. <clears throat> gametes. Gametes are sex cells. They're the egg and the sperm. There's an egg, there's a bunch of sperm. It's from the Greek word, and it's important to look at this Greek root, word root and see what it really means. Wife, husband, to marry, or marriage. And 
egg and sperm, the Greek root that we get gamete from, is from the Greek word for husband, wife, marry, and marriage. And in our early embryo, here's our zygote again. Two pronuclei, one male, one female. They merge into one nucleus, and, and then the cell divides, and we've got a two-celled embryo, the morula. The scientists that are doing cloning, and these are images that were taken from the group that cloned a human embryo back in 2013. They will take an egg, a human egg, there's the nucleus of that egg, and they'll suck it out. So, and you can see the nucleus there in the pipette. They will then take a skin cell, or some other body cell, and remove the nucleus from that cell. Now this cell, your body cell, has two sets of chromosomes already. Just like that zygote had when the two nuclei fused. One nucleus with two sets of chromosomes. They'll take a nu oops, a nucleus then from a body cell and insert that nucleus into the egg cell that had no nucleus. As soon as this diploid nucleus gets inside that cell that was once an egg, we have a zygote, the first stage of human development. It's one cell. It has a nucleus that has two sets of chromosomes. It's inside this zona pellucida here, this gelatinous mass that surrounds it. And all they do then is give it a little jolt to start it developing. They can't control the developing, they just start it. And then it continues to develop on its own like an embryo normally does. It would go through the morula stage, it would become a blastocyst, and if a uterus were present, it would implant. So they can't control human development. They can initiate it after they make the zygote, and they can stop it, but they can't control it. And let's just do a side-by-side -side comparison, because we're going to look at this and then see what some honest scientists have to say. But this is the normal way. We have a zygote. Those nuclei fuse into, into one nucleus. It starts to divide. We get some morulae here, several cells. It becomes a blastocyst. In cloning, and these are all images of cloned embryos down here. The zygote, there's the nucleus, the diploid nucleus. It develops into morulae and it becomes a blastocyst. Now I'll explain a few things. The green here are just some cells that were stained with a particular fluorescent dye. I use this image because it's specifically an image of a cloned embryo, and I didn't want to do anything that was a little devious and use a, a better picture. This is really a cloned embryo. And we got this area here that's sort of bulging out. Before the blastocyst implants, it has to get outside of this gelatinous mass. So, and, and scientists call that sort of hatching. The blastocyst has to hatch. And that's what this blastocyst is doing right now. It's getting outside of the gelatinous mass, and once it's outside, it can implant in the wall of the uterus. <coughs> So side by side, and these cells at each stage, embryos look very, very similar. They look the same. There's no difference between these morula, between these blastocysts, and the only thing that makes this zygote look different from this zygote is it's got a couple of pipettes around it. But that's because it was manipulated in the lab. Now here's a face that some of you may be familiar with. It's James Thompson at the University of Wisconsin. He was the first person to extract stem cells from a human embryo back in 1998. He was interviewed, MSNBC, 
in 2005 <clears throat> about cloning because there were lots of people that wanted to clone embryos. And like a lot of journalists, the one that was interviewing him was throwing him a lot of softball questions. And, and James Thompson, to his credit, he says, no, wait, stop, time out. Because he knows what the vocabulary and the lexicon of science is. And he says, see, you're trying to define it away, and it does not work. If you create an embryo by nuclear transfer and give it to somebody who didn't know where it came from, remember that previous slide? All those stages of embryonic development, whether it was natural or cloned, looked alike. If you gave it to somebody, there would be no test that you could do on that embryo to say where it came from. None. It is what it is. It's a human embryo. And he goes on, he says, it's true that they have a much lower probability of giving rise to a child. That's an important word, giving rise to a child. He doesn't say giving rise to a human. It already is a human. He says giving rise to a child, and a child is a later stage of human development. Some scientists and journalists would tell us that it has a lower probability of giving rise to a human. But here we're getting the truth. It has a lower probability of giving rise to a child. But by any reasonable definition, he says, you're creating an embryo. And he uses the word creating an embryo. And he tells this journalist flat out, if you try to define it away, you're being disingenuous. So you're violating this lexicon of science, the vocabulary that you, we use to communicate honestly and openly, and that's where a lot of deception occurs. Another scientist who's made the news in recent years is Shinya Yamanaka from Japan. And a colleague of his in Japan who ran an IVF clinic had him come in and he looked at some embryos under the microscope. And he said, when I saw the embryo, I suddenly realized there was such a small difference between it and my daughter's. I thought we can't keep destroying embryos for our research. There must be a better way. And in 2006, he found a better way. And in 2012, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for finding that better way. So two world-renowned scientists who know what's going on. We may not agree with what Dr. Thompson did back in 98, but he's honest with what he did. And he knows what the lexicon of vocabulary of science is, and he uses it, and he sticks to it. So here we are, we're gonna move now into what some of these other scientists do to try and justify the research, because they get in some silly semantic juggling gains. The first one I want to mention is this false dichotomy. We all know what a false dichotomy is. You've heard it at grocery stores. Would you like to donate a dollar to help fund children's cancer research, or do you hate children? Okay, you've, you've heard that before. So that's a false dichotomy. But what the scientists have done here is they have taken one thing, cloning, and they've tried to make it two things. One they call therapeutic cloning, and that's the morally good kind of cloning. And the other they call reproductive cloning, which is the morally bad kind of cloning. And I've got to ask the rhetorical question, if cloning is not reproductive, what is it? Now, Neither of these, the interesting thing here is neither of these have happened. No scientist ever, anywhere, has achieved therapeutic cloning. We haven't seen any therapies come from a cloned human embryo, none. By their own definition, they called it therapeutic. And also, the definition of, their definition of reproductive cloning is allowing the embryo 
to come to term and be born. So, and that hasn't happened yet either. So by their own definition, we've never seen reproductive cloning and we've never seen therapeutic cloning. But they painted one to be morally good and the other to be morally bad. When the interesting thing, when we look at each of these definitions, what's morally bad, cloning a human is morally bad. And each of these involves cloning a human. And we look at the other half, curing a disease, that's morally good. And babies being born, that's good. So each definition here has something that's bad and something that's good. But they've tried to resurrect this false dichotomy to allow this kind of cloning while at the same time banning this kind of cloning and not telling us that what they're really doing is just cloning a human, period. So how do they do that? Well, I like to call it Humpty Dumpty vocabulary. When I use a word Humpty Dumpty said in rather a scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master, that's all. And this gets at a couple of important issues here. One is the word games that scientists play. Can you make words mean different things? And two, at the end, which is to be master, it gets to the arrogance of the scientist. A lot of scientists are put up on pedestals, goes to their head, and it's like, man, I'm a scientist and I know what I'm talking about, so let me tell you how it works. And they're making up definitions and all sorts of things. We need more Alice's, and we need a lot less and fewer Humpty Dumpty's. So some of these new words that they've invented are applied here to early stages of human development. All three early stages have been called. Now these have real specific names that scientists have given them. Human, embryo, or zygote, morula, and blastocyst. But journalists and scientists are telling us that they're activated eggs. What's that? Nobody knows what an activated egg is because there's no such thing. It's a reprogrammed human skin cell. What Shinya Yamanaka did to earn the Nobel Prize was reprogram human skin cells. So if you're working with embryonic stem cells or cloning, you're not reprogramming human skin cells. It's very different. Some people have called them surplus products of IVF treatment. Not embryos, not humans, but now they're products of IVF treatment. Or they're called pre-embryos. The zygote has been called a reconstructed oocyte and a fertilized egg. There's no such thing as a fertilized egg. When fertilization occurs, the egg ceases to exist. It's a zygote. The sperm ceases to exist. It's a zygote. We have a whole new entity that's been established at fertilization, the zygote. It's not a fertilized egg. Totipotent stem cells has been used for a morula pluripotent stem cells for the blastocyst. And then we get into this clump mentality. If it's an embryo that's more than one cell, well then it's a clump. And it gets called all sorts of things, including a developed egg. An egg is a cell that does not develop. The embryo develops. That's why it's called embryological development and human development, not egg development. The egg does not develop. Things to watch out for now that scientists and journalists are throwing at us. Semantic subterfuge, it's been called by some. Disingenuous, irresponsible journalism. Euphemisms. False dichotomies, deceit, and lies. And the big one are qualifiers. Little words that can change the meaning of an entire article in a newspaper or magazine. And the worst one here is if, if. 
It's a little dinky word, and they can use it at the beginning of an article once and go on for five pages with everything they talk about after that predicated on an if, which in most cases has a chance of success of less than 5% if, but other ones may be perhaps possible potential. In 2013, the Wall Street Journal had this to say about the uh, work that was done out in Oregon where they cloned human embryos. The Wall Street Journal is normally a, a newspaper that we can count on for some straightforward, some honest reporting. But this is what they had to say. Experiment brings human cloning one step closer. Well, no, it, it didn't bring it one step closer. It brought it to a reality. They used cloning technology to transform human skin cells into embryonic stem cells. The only way you can get an embryonic stem cell is to harvest it from an embryo, period. That's it. That's the only way you can get one. But here they say it was transformed. That's a false statement. The researchers stopped well short of creating a human clone. No, they didn't. That's precisely what they did. And the article even talks about that. All of the work that's reported in the publication was the steps they had to do to make that clone. They focused on the clump of cells. They didn't use the real name for that. That contains embryonic stem cells. Now here they're getting a little closer to the truth. They say that this is a part of the embryo that contains the stem cells, but it's a blastocyst. It's really a human embryo. It's not just a clump of cells that contains that inner cell mass. They got one sentence right. One way to harvest fresh tissue is from human embryos. Yes, it is. That's what they did. But that's controversial because it, the embryos get destroyed in the process. Yes, it does. And that's precisely what these scientists did. But here they tell us that it's controversial and it gets destroyed up here. They said they didn't do it. And then they go on and they reiterate this achievement is a long way from creating a cloned human embryo. It's not a long way from doing it. It is precisely what they did. And the scientific publication that uses all the correct terminology talked about how they had to use such and such a technique and tweak it in such and such a way to clone the human embryo. That's specifically what they did. They can't get away with using the bad language in a scientific publication because those get reviewed by their peers and they'd get called on it. It doesn't get reviewed by lay people. And what we hear is this watered down version that's reported in the papers. In 2014, there was another group in the United States that cloned human embryos. And this was in the Washington Post in April, April 20th, Easter Sunday, by the way. And this reporter sort of played it a little differently. Instead of uh, using these non-words that are outside the spectrum of the lexicon of science, he chose to play up the medical advances that came with these cloned embryos and stem cells that you could get from them. And if we look at the stuff that's bold and underlined, fully half of the paragraph or more talks about extraordinary new treatments from pluripotent stem cells. Notice it doesn't say embryonic stem cells. Pluripotent stem cells. They can grow into all sorts of different tissues. This is great. We can grow insulin-producing cells for patients with diabetes. That sounds like a wonderful thing. Let's do it. People that have macular degeneration, that's an eye disease, won't have to lose their sight. Great. We're going to, start, we're going to cure things. Therapies are on the horizon. We can grow whole organs matched exactly to patients and replace diseased ones. Good to go. But let's look at this paragraph a little closer. And this is an unabridged paragraph from that Washington Post article. When we look at it a little closer, well, we don't have extraordinary new treatments. We find out that scientists have been holding out the prospect of all that. So for 
16 years, scientists have been dangling this carrot in front of us. And we don't have insulin producing cells for the patients. They say they might be able to get insulin producing cells. And if you have an eye disease, you might still go blind. And there's even potential, we don't know how much, to grow whole organs that are matched to patients that could replace diseased ones. And even if they grow the whole organ, there's a big difference between growing it and surgically putting that organ into a patient that needs an organ. And I might mention just on the side here about what's going on with adult stem cell research in this area. Well, there are more than 30 people in the United States that are walking around with bladders, an organ that was grown in the lab. <clears throat> so that's where they can take the matrix of a bladder and use adult stem cells to get all of the right kinds of cells on that bladder and then implant that bladder, a functional bladder, into a human. There are at least three women that were born with a malformed vagina that now have a functional vagina because they've grown functional vaginas in the lab with adult stem cells. So we're not dealing with mites and potentials and prospects and coulds. We're dealing with the reality and it's already happened and there are patients now with those successes that can speak to that reality. We don't have to work with the qualifier language. So here's the reality of the situation as it stands right now and as it stood since the beginning of this research. And in both cases, it's uh, up in heaven. You got uh, one gentleman here, he says, I died waiting for embryonic stem cell research to find a cure. What about you? He's the carrot that they've been dangling out there for. He's been waiting. And the, the little feller on the right, he says, I was the embryo. Health by death is a desperate mockery of medicine. And down here, St. Peter is greeting everybody at the pearly gates. Look at this line. He says, uh, partial birth abortion? And the little guy says, no, nope. embryonic stem cell research. So comparing the two types of stem cells, embryonic stem cells were told that the big advantage is that they can become every cell in the body. That's not an advantage. Everybody here knows that an embryonic stem cell can become every cell in the body because you did just that. Everybody here started as one cell and you became a morula and a blastocyst. And those cells became every cell in the body. Everybody here is an example of that. And they're telling us it's a big advantage. And they also say it's an advantage because they can do so rapidly. I'm telling you it's a big disadvantage Remember how fast human development occurs. One cell, two-thirds two of development complete in eight weeks. Extremely rapid. And scientists can't control that. And it's the same problem with these embryonic stem cells when they get them growing in the lab or putting them into a patient or a mouse. They can't control it. When they get into a body, they're going to grow rapidly, divide rapidly, some scientists and physicians call them proliferating cells. And they become every tissue. They form tumors. Now, postnatal stem cells, the ethical stem cell, adult stem cells, are found everywhere, almost all tissues. When they're needed, the body calls them to work and they can repair and regenerate damaged tissue. They can home in to the damaged tissue. Your body sends out signals and cues that said, I'm damaged, help. And they can recruit other cells to come to that site and facilitate the repair. So our take home message, embryonic development is self-directed and it's rapid. 
So it's not an advantage that those stem cells can become everything and that they can become everything quickly. Embryonic stem cells do that by themselves without any help anyway. It's actually a disadvantage. Scientists can't control that process. Beware of Humpty Dumpty vocabulary, qualifiers, and irresponsible journalism. It's out there and it's rampant and you have to be careful and watch out for it. And it's real easy to miss words like if. And that's the big one that, that causes lots of problems. And finally, embryonic stem cells offer no advantages. They do not work. They have not yet been put to work to fight disease, which is what we've been, that's the carrot that they've been dangling, which we've been told for over 15 years now, and it hasn't happened. Adult stem cells do that naturally. Sometimes they need some help to get more cells to the damaged tissue, and some sometimes they'll need uh, the right kinds of cells to the damaged tissue, and that's where the scientist and the physician can get involved. So I'll stop it there, and I'll take some questions. Yes? Um, so did the, the people that had the bladders, did they have an existing bladder already that was diseased and not functioning, that they took the cells from, from that specific bladder cells to grow a new bladder, or are stem cells within you and me that have the potential to develop into what, organs? What, what, they, what they did here, and it's actually rather interesting because uh, the bladder is a very interesting organ, and there are two ways they can do this. They can either take a human bladder or a pig bladder. Now, some of you may have heard about uh, what they're called xenografts, where they use uh, transplantation from a different animal into a human. And, and a pig is, is a common organ to use, common animal to use for some organs. Because one, um, despite the, where they live, they're actually very clean inside. <laughs> and, and two, their organs are about the same size as a human. So one way is to take a pig bladder and strip it of all of the cells. One of the big concerns here with this regenerative medicine work is immune rejection. If you get something injected into you that is not you, your body says, you know, it pushes it away and kills it and gets rid of it. That's a big problem. But, but if they strip it of all the cells, what's left is this matrix, a, a non-cellular thing that has the shape of a bladder. And in order to make it work, they have to get the right kinds of cells to grow on that matrix. And that's where they'll take adult stem cells from the patient who's going to get the bladder. And they get the, the right kind of tissue for that, and it's usually um, endothelial tissue, which is a tissue around that part of the body. And they will seed that matrix of a bladder, that thing that's shaped like a bladder with these cells, and they will bathe it in that. And after several weeks of growing it in a lab, they can implant that and transplant that into the human patient that needs it. And they're walking around today, it's over 30 have been done this way with, with those bladders. Would that be possible, like with a, 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 any kind of endocrine producing organs <coughs> that, you know, like a thyroid or a pancreas or that actually secretes a hormone or? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, so there's, there's lots of steps that are that, are, that have to go into this, and certain, some, certainly some tissues and organs are easier to work with than others. So, and the, uh, a good website to look at, and there's a several institutes out there that are doing some great work. Um, this, the bladder work was done at um, Wake Forest, I believe. It's the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative, excuse me, Regenerative Medicine, WFIRM. 
and it's .org or .edu or something. And also the um, Armed Forces Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And there's one at the University of Pittsburgh, the McGowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine. But those three are doing some incredible work with regrowing these tissues and organs. And the Armed Forces Institute is mostly for vets that are coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq, and they're growing whole chunks of leg muscle that have been blown apart, blown out. Yeah, another question. You mentioned earlier at the very start of your uh, talk about these male cells inside uh, the mothers. Why is the mother's immune system not removing those foreign male sure. cells? Uh, because they're from the, uh, the embryo and not from her own body. Uh, male cells, not female cells. Uh, good. That's a that's a real good question, and that that gets to a lot of the immunology of development in childbirth. I mean, and the same thing because, and interestingly, the placenta I mentioned is leaky, but it leaks the other direction too. So mom's cells go to the baby, and and we got the same immune issue going on there. So. But that gets to, I mean, issues with the uh, RH blood factors. Uh, blood types are different between baby and mom, and, and why. So now I'm not, a, I'm not an immunologist, and I'm not, not up on, on how all this works. But those are, those are good questions that, always, that the scientists are always looking at. And, and specifically, one that really comes up is when the maternal cells cross into the fetal circulation, and we start seeing immune problems that have to be dealt with. Embryo stem cells do not work. What is the motivation for pushing for embryo stem cell research? I, I think a lot of it is pride and, and money. They can get money to fund a, a big research lab and hire postdocs and other scientists to do the work and if they can make some kind of breakthrough that no other scientist has yet made, then, then there's a lot of pride that goes with that, you know, the, the look what I've accomplished kind of thing. And, and, I'm, and I'm not saying that to point out that, oh, look, they're really bad. I, I was in that area for a long time, and I published papers. And, and I've had discussions with some people that uh, were, I submitted something for publication before some of the competitors in the field, but the people I was submitted ahead of knew the editor of the journal. So theirs got published first, and they got the credit, and I didn't. So I've been there, and I know what this, and I've got the same issues. It's pride, and that's important. It's a big thing for a scientist to put that feather in their cap, but I think that's a large part of it. And it, but, they, but they don't work. It's, it's 16 cells. I mean, you can go to a great website, clinicaltrials.gov, and, and just do a search for stem cell and, and see how many clinical trials you get where they're using stem cells. And it, it's probably going to be over 4,000. And fewer than 20 of those or 25 of those are using embryonic or fetal stem cells. The remainder are with some kind of an adult or ethical cord blood stem cell. So it's, it's not something I'm making up here about whether they work or not. The scientific community knows they don't work. And if we look at clinical trials that are being conducted right now, all of the ones that are being conducted with embryonic stem cells are phase one clinical trials, very early stages. And if you look at those that are being done with ethical stem cells, they're phase two and phase three, or they're even beyond phase three and getting ready to be submitted to the FDA for approval to be used. So it is a night and day difference. Thank you. All right, we're running the time real quickly. Um, as this